here today. David says, When thou saidst, Seek my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. And may that be our intentions today. The Lord has invited us to seek his face, and may we respond by saying, just like David here, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. We want to begin the service by just spending some time quietly before the Lord, getting our hearts and minds prepared. So I invite you to come to the altar if health uh, allows you to do so and kneel. And let's just spend about two or three minutes quietly before the Lord, bowing before Him, giving Him thanksgiving, confessing any areas of faults that we had this past week, and then asking the Lord to do a work in our hearts this morning as, as we've come here to worship Him and hear His Word. So come on up if you're able, and we'll have about three minutes of quiet time today. Get your patriotic bulletin out. Every teacher in the house knows that it's President's Day on Monday. Every teacher is very well aware of that. <laughs> and anybody else that works for the government. And pastors too. All right. Uh, if you want to open and look along, tonight we're going to be partying like it's 2022. We have a bonus session from the Genesis story, reading biblical narratives. I'll be doing a teaching on that very mysterious being in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent. And it's going to be a great study, I believe, very insightful for us and helpful in our Christian lives. Uh, we're going to have dinner at 5.30. We have pizza and vegetable sticks and hummus and chips and soda. So we want to invite you out to that tonight. We're getting ready for it, and uh, you'll meet at 5.30. The lesson will start at 6 o'clock. Um, please look. There have been a number of people who have turned in writings from the class on the Genesis narratives, and today we're very happy to feature a paragraph by Lori Bigelow and Evelyn Vega. Very nice thoughts that they present and challenging thoughts. So when you get your time... I hope you'll read that, work done by our class members. Speaking about class, I am so proud of our church. A number of people signed up at the deadline last Sunday for independent study of uh, our spring Bible study that's coming up starting March 6th called The Discipline of Grace. And we now have 40 people signed up. And I think that's just wonderful because some won't be able to come, but they've decided, you know what, I need to step up and get into this information with the rest of the people, even though I can't be in the class. And this reminds me so much of what Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and, 15, and verse 15. George, do you know what that says? 2 Timothy 2, 15? Study until thyself approve. Amen. George is always right on. We're commanded to study. As Christians, we have to uh, improve our faith through hard study. So we have 40 people that are going to do that. And I think your lives are going to be changed. And I think everybody's going to see a difference in you when you come to this greater understanding of God's grace living out the Christian walk. And you will be studying to show yourself approved. So I just... No, my heart's just really large today to see the, the improvement of the sign-up. So thank you, everybody, for um, boosting me up with your zeal. And then finally, my last announcement is next week we have Beans Wheelbarrow. Believe it or not, we're saying goodbye to February. But if you remember your loose change, and your loose dollar bills, and if you have a spare $1,000 check sitting around, remember that, and we'll do Beans Wheelbarrow. And so this morning, uh, the uh, worship team couldn't understand why this image goes along with the men's breath. <laughs> well, it's had double meaning here. Number one, as Ms. Danae mentioned, she had just the other night. If you would like to bring some nopales in for our breakfast, you're welcome to do that. 
be great to have in the morning. We'll, we'll probably have salsa or something to go with our great omelet. So if you want to make us some omelets, bring them in ready made. Um, unless Oscar wants to uh, make them handmade there. No, we did that once for men's breakfast. That was kind of a, that was kind of a chore. But um, the, actually, the second meaning for it is that uh, please, please encourage the young boys uh, from whatever age all the way up to, you know, 95, whoever wants to. But mainly the focus is the young ones uh, all the way up, you know, elementary all the way through high school. Uh, Brother Navarez is going to be hosting a little class on how to prep and, and garden and how to prep some soil uh, for succulents mainly, right, Brother you said For succulents. So that's what I put this image up there for. Now, I don't know if we're going to be making beautiful pots like that, but he's definitely going to be giving a class and showing the, the young men of the church um, just some gardening techniques that he's learned over the years and how to uh, make those nice, beautiful pots for Mom and Mother's Day, right? Coming up. So uh, he's going to be uh, hosting a class. So please, if you know some folks who have some young boys and you'd like to have them come to breakfast, um, the plan is, we'll see, we don't want to overwhelm him. The plan is to go over at, right after breakfast to the Navarres as he's going to show out in the backyard, uh, not only show off his handiwork that he's done over the years, he and Karen, uh, but also to have more room and just an easier way for him to show that class. So please come on out, uh, if, uh, you know, those of, the, uh, uh, those of you uh, males out there with your sons or nephews or grandsons or whatever, bring them out for this uh, breakfast time in class right after. So, all right, Children's Church is continuing on the book of John, ages 5 through 12. Please invite a young person for these exciting lessons. The title of this particular section for John uh, 11 through 16 is called Jesus awesome power, awesome love, and it works out just perfectly as it uh, displays the, uh, uh, the passion uh, in these stories. So this year, right at Easter time, we're going to be explaining to them the meaning of the Passover and how it relates to the passion of Christ. <clears throat> and youth and family outings and events, hosts are needed. Uh, Ms. Vanessa, where are my survey sheets? They're so hard. They're really good too. Yes, okay. So we have some survey sheets going out to the young ones, um, who's Connie kind of suggested, for activities that they would like, food that they would like to eat, places they would like to go. So we are going to be having uh, an event in March, and I'll give you the dates next to, uh, you know what, I forgot, but that's not up there. No, I didn't, I did. I'm not as forgetful as I thought. <laughs> um, our youth activity, first one is coming up in March 12th, a pretty low-key one. We're going to have some games, we have some uh, some cars, we play some Uno, who knows, maybe Monopoly. We'll throw some stuff out there, and we'll have some snacks. Uh, 6 p.m., it'll be our game night. But then after that, we'd like to tailor it to what some of the young folks would like, and that way you can understand, hey, how can I help out? What are some of the things they like to do? I think I can host this. I think I can uh, sponsor it in some way. So this first one we'll have, we'll kick it off uh, here at the church, 6 o'clock on uh, March 12th, at game night. And uh, we'll get started from there. So if you can help us out um, subsequently after that in signing up and helping to sponsor, we really appreciate it. Those are my announcements. All right. Pastor is going to give himself some time to get set up. So in that time, I turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. And while you're turning there, are you in the mood to celebrate a nice victory on Sunday? Yes. Well, our brother Eric McKenna is back. So let's give him a hand. frightened that we might lose him about a month ago because of the COVID. He was hospitalized, just having a bad time, um, but he pulled through, so he is another one of our very special Comeback Kids. That's his nickname, the Comeback Kid, all right? So we're in Nehemiah chapter 8, and if you were here last week, you're going to see a couple verses that you might remember. But this is part two, how to get strength in hard times. If you look at verse number nine, and Nehemiah, which is the Tershathah, which means governor, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people said unto all the people, this day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet. They were Baptists. 
and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The last line of verse 10 contains the primary argument against sadness. And what is that? It is God is our strength. That is our primary argument against sadness. Now let's get our Hebrew on this morning. Repeat after me, ma'oz. That is the Hebrew word translated strength in verse number 10. Put your index finger under this word. It's very unique. It's very important that you understand the meaning of this word, ma'oz. There were other Hebrew words that could have been used that would also be translated strength, but the Holy Spirit used this word, and this word means refuge, fortress, place of protection. Even in Judges chapter 6 and verse 26, it's translated rock. So as we read, the joy of the Lord is your strength, you need to understand that the meaning of strength in this sense is the Lord is your refuge. The Lord is your fortress, the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is a place of protection for you. And even in a very literal sense, uh, the Lord is your rock. Why is it important that we understand this argument against sadness? Because I pointed out last Sunday that this text implies that the joy and the delight of the Lord fulfill a protective function in our lives, keeping us from being swallowed in despair. We all need this protection because we can be swallowed up in despair. What are the aspects of our life that can cause us to be swallowed up in despair? Well, we are vulnerable to despair over past failures. We are vulnerable to despair over present difficulties. Sometimes we just get overwhelmed with everything that is currently on us. We can also be vulnerable to despair over future uncertainties. We worry about the future, and that overwhelms us. Like worrying about it will really change anything, right? But this is us. This is our weaknesses. And we can be like these people in Nehemiah's time, sad over these things. They had to be talked out of their mood and shifted to a place of protection to where they weren't sad. And that argument against their sadness was Nehemiah saying, hey, listen, the joy of the Lord is your place of protection against despair. Now, if there ever was a ready answer for someone who asks, why do I need to go to church? This is it. This is one of the very uh, basic answers as to why we need to go to church because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we come together and we rub off on each other in our excitement for the Lord, we receive a special dose of strength. How many have experienced over the time you come to church that by being here, you've been strengthened? Amen. Yeah, that's because we're singing these songs, and we're praying, and we're together. So there's a lot of reasons why we have to go to church, but this would be one of them. So because the joy of the Lord is your strength, we saw last week the argument against despair over past failures is that the Lord is for us. Remember what Nehemiah, the, the priest said, the Levite said to the people in Nehemiah 9.17. They said, But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsook them not. 
when we feel guilty and ashamed of our past failures and we feel like God is done with us, we will feel overwhelmed with despair. And the devil is the accuser. And he would like to get us to the place where we feel that the Lord really wants nothing to do with us anymore because of our past failures. We've let him down. But nothing could be further from the truth. These people and their ancestors had sinned so badly against the Lord that the Lord had them taken out of the homeland of Israel and deported to Babylon. And that's where they've been for 70 long years. But the fact that now they're back in Israel and the temple has been rebuilt and the walls have been rebuilt shows that there's nothing that the Lord would rather do than forgive. And so this was the exhortation of the Levites to the people. They were presenting to them the joy of the Lord. We know you feel badly about your past and about the past of your, your parents and grandparents and what they did to God. But listen to our prayer. God is a God ready to pardon. There's nothing He would rather do than forgive sin. Think about what He's paid to cleanse us of our sin. He's given His Son as a sacrifice the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Amen. God doesn't concentrate on the enormity of your sin. He concentrates on the enormity of Christ's sacrifice. Amen. And that makes Him ready to pardon. Jeremiah 3.22 says, Return, you backslidden, sliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Amen. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. And like I said last week, when God heals us of our backslidings, we become stronger against that sin than ever before. And as he heals our backslidings, some people, they never commit those sins again after the Lord heals them of their backslidings. They never even feel tempted for those sins anymore because the Lord, that's what He wants to do. We said last week, God is not only the God of salvation, He's the God of restoration. David's prayer in Psalm 51, 12, after he had committed the sin of adultery and conspired to have the husband of the woman who he committed this act with killed in battle in his prayer, penitential prayer in Psalm 51 12 he said to the Lord restore to me restore to me the joy of thy salvation So the argument against the despair of failures is the Lord is for us. He's ready to pardon. And that is the joy of the Lord. That is our strength. That is our place of protection. When we feel despair over our failures. Is thou our God ready to pardon? God is on the edge of his throne waiting to forgive sins of anybody who will come to Him in the name of Jesus and confess. Mm -hmm. That's our God. That is joy to me. Because I realize that every day I fail the Lord in thoughts, words, and deeds. Just my thoughts alone sometimes scare me to death. And yet, this is our God. Secondly, we see the joy of the Lord is our strength, is the argument against despair over present difficulties. And what is it? What is this argument uh, against despair over our present difficulties? It is this, that the Lord is with us. God is not only for us, but God is always with us. 
When these difficulties begin to pile upon us, we don't have to bear these difficulties alone. Amen. We can see these difficulties and understand that God is with us and that God is going to use these difficulties. The big difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is God gives purpose to our suffering. And God is doing something in our difficulties. He's taking away the rough edges. He's humbling us. He's making us more like His Son, more dependent on Him, causing us to grow in our faith. Look at Nehemiah chapter 1, if you will. Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's go back and see how this book got started. Look at the first four verses. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, so he's in Persia, that Hanani, so he's still there from the deportation, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, so they came back from Jerusalem, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had gone back, that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left, the captivity there in the province, are in what? Great, Great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So the temple had already been built, but the walls of Jerusalem are still uh, in the shape that they were in when Babylon came in 70 years earlier and destroyed, well, actually longer than 70 years now. We're, we're well past that. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven concerning the condition of Jerusalem and what the people were going through. Obviously, with no walls, they were pray to all of the hostile clans and tribes around them that had been living there when they were in captivity. And so it's like, think about you going back to your neighborhood house 70 years later, and you walk down the street thinking everybody's supposed to know you and know that you lived here before and that you ruled these streets. Well, the truth of the matter is, you mean nothing to them if you come back to your house 70 years ago. The whole thing has changed. Nobody knows you. And they really don't think you belong. You think you're the old kid on the street, but they see you as the new kid on the block. And they're going to pick on you. They're going to give you funny looks. You will not be welcome. I've made the mistake of going to my boyhood town gawking at the places where I used to hang out. People are ready to call the police. <laughs> Who is this weirdo? I'm no weirdo. I lived here. This place was better then than it is now because this is where I lived. You've got to believe me, it was better then. <laughs> right, sister? Ronan Avenue? What's the name of that street? Is it Ronan or Roman? I still have my memory. Roman. <laughs> All right. So now let's go over to uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance, why is your face sad, seeing that thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant hath found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, in, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, 
The queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come unto, into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertaineth to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to what? The good hand of my God upon me. Jeremiah was sad, but all of a sudden he saw that God was not only for him, but the Lord was with him and was giving him favor. In this time of difficulty, to turn the king's heart to allow him to go back and rebuild the walls. Jeremiah, Nehemiah was not bearing this difficulty alone. alone. He saw that the good hand of my God was upon him. Verse 9, Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Samballat the Hornonite and Tobiah the servant, the servant the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So here we see this tension, difficulty in Nehemiah's life, but God with him through every step of the difficulty. Turn over to verse number 17. Nehemiah meets with the people with the plan to rebuild. Then said I unto them, ye see the distress that we are in. God's people can be in distress, right? We can be swallowed up by distress. See the distress we, that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of what? The hand of my God, which was where? Which was upon me. As also the king's word, words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Well, if God is with us, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Samballat the Hornonite and Tobiah the servant of the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion, no heritage, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. So let's put ourselves in Nehemiah's sandals. It is a tough task that he has. He's got opposition all around him. But what was his argument against the despair over present difficulties that he might have felt. His argument, as we saw three times by his testimony, is the Lord is with me. In all of this, the Lord is with me. And we all know sometimes how life can wig us out. I think of a couple weeks ago, our church was hosting a wedding that was going to involve 260 guests. And a reception out there, way beyond our seating capacity. And you know, my nickname is Doubting Thomas. I'm a worrying pastor. And I'm like, you know, 260 people here, that's going to be like an invasion. And I wasn't officiating the wedding. Uh, a colleague, his daughter was getting married, so we were just being good to another pastor's family and uh, opening up our venue for them. But you know how weddings are when it comes to churches and halls. 
nothing stays as is. They wanted all this stripped out, and in the hall, the same thing, everything taken out. And, you know, with this electrical stuff, I'm the only one who understands it. So I'm like, you know, I'm the guy that's got to take all this down and put it all together for Sunday. Because most weddings are Saturday, right? Yeah. Saturday afternoon. So I'm like, oh, life is getting way too busy for me. I feel so stressed. And I was getting ready to take care of business on Thursday morning. And then Pam came into me and said, our shower is stopped up. It won't drain at all. <laughs> and I'm like, that's easy for you to say. You already had your shower. <laughs> I was hoping it would drain down. And I went in there and looked. And I saw her old water. I said, uh-uh. No shower for me today. And I'm like, oh, great. Now i got to call a plumber. Plus, get all this done. Then... Well, I felt, like, I felt despair. I was like, this, this weekend is getting way too crazy already, you know. I've got to find a plumber. And immediately, I think because I knew I was going to be preaching this sermon soon, I started to get into the presence of the Lord. And he took away all of that the nervousness and anxiety and made me thankful. I said, well, at least, at least it's only the tub that stopped up. It could have been the toilets. <laughs> Much less of an emergency. Because I can just go to the kitchen sink and I can wash my hair in the kitchen sink. And still be a pastor with my normal do today. This is fine. <laughs> then I was like, and the kitchen sink will also help me in the most important area of the day. I can sponge bath my underarms. I'm going to be fine. And so things started to feel good because I began to be thankful that it was only the tub. And then I began to think of Elise where she is in Africa and how sometimes they don't even have water to stop up their tubs. They're waiting for water to flow. And I said, I'm, I'm in really good shape today. Even though the hot water would have felt great. So then I go out to my car and I look and it's like, wow, that left front tire looks low. And then there's a screw in the tire. And I'm like, but I've got to drive to Huntington Beach. No time to get it changed. Lord, please keep this tire safe with the screw in it as I drive to Huntington Beach. And again, just thanksgiving. Thanksgiving that the Lord kept the tire slightly inflated for the whole time. But here's the thing. Why, Lord, why now? Well, when the plumber came over, as he finished up, he gave me a really good price, so I was buttering up to him and having, you know, friendly conversation because I wanted to give you that same good price next time. And so I asked him, you know, uh, how's your wife doing? And then he began to just for the first time ever become so transparent with me and begin to tell me things very personal that he never told me before. And he said, my wife is going under test. She's got liver disease. And he began to talk about it. And if you look on the prayer list, um, I was able to tell him that night our church is going to pray for your wife. Mm -hmm. Then when I got the tire fixed, I asked the gentleman, because he had told me about his mom before, how's your mom? And he said, do you mean my wife? I said, well, I would like to know how your wife is doing, um, but I was thinking about your mom. We talked about her last time. And she said, he said, well, my mom's fine. The problem is my wife. I was just with her all day yesterday at the City of Hope getting chemotherapy. She has cancer. And I was being able to tell him, our church will pray for you. And if you look on the prayer sheet today, uh, her name is on the prayer sheet. So what seemed to be difficulties for me that was making me anxious were appointments God was giving to me to experience the joy of the Lord. Amen. 
And when I figured out that that stopped up tub and that broken tire, that no good tire brought me into contact with these men who probably hadn't talked to anybody else on the outside about it until I was there asking about their, their family and then assuring them that there was prayer. I'll tell you, that was my argument against feeling overwhelmed is God is with me. He's made these appointments and it is, it is worth it. If this is the outcome of difficulties, it is worth it. And what does Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 tell us? Let your conduct be without covetousness. Don't wish you had someone else's life to live. God is with you in your life and your circumstances right now, so you don't want to be anybody else in their lives. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Covetousness, be content with such things that you have, including your problems. God's with you. Stuff is going on. He's doing a work. He's taking off the edge. He's humbling you. He's giving you opportunities to appreciate other people's problems who have it much worse than you. I almost felt like a knucklehead getting you know, all worked up over, over uh, a stopped up drain when the guy who fixed it for me has a wife with liver disease. I almost felt like a doofus getting all upset over a bad tire when the guy that fixed my tire has a wife who has cancer. I mean, the Lord is with us and He's going to put it all in perspective. For He Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we may boldly say what? The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. So I think that all of us could use a little relief from the things that we go through, but we need not fear with what we're going through. We need not fear that we will not have the strength to endure because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if you just realize every moment in the difficulty that He is with you, you're going to be in good shape for the shape you're in. And we have people in our congregation that have testified of that. Uh, George and Jean Glover would be one. Eric McKenna would be one. Uh, Dr. Connie Fetter would be one. Uh, almost our whole congregation my sister-in-law, with an exclamation mark, would be one with three exclamation marks. And we think it's all going to be over. I could name every one of you, I think. We think we're done. But the Lord is with us. And that was Jeremiah's uh, argument against it all. Uh, he kept saying, my God, which was good upon me. Look at that in verse number 18. The Lord wants that to be your testimony. My good, my God, which was good upon me. I love that language. I need to memorize that. When people ask me about my ordeals, how to get through it? My God, which was good upon me got me through it. He's good upon us. We learn so much from Nehemiah. Um, the joy of the Lord is our strength, finally, is the argument against despair over future uncertainties. Concerning despair over future uncertainties, the Lord is working everything out according to His plan. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 6 and find verse number 15.
Nehemiah was severely contested, but look at verse 15. So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elul, in 50 and 2 days. That is a miracle. Against all that opposition, the, the walls were built in that amount of time. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that the work, that this work was wrought or done of whom? Of our God. They figured out the miracle of these walls being built in 52 days, that God had done that through his servant Nehemiah. And so with certain un uh, future uncertainties, Nehemiah had to be affected by what's going to happen when we try and rebuild these walls. And we've got so many people against us, so many tribes that are hostile, that want to take us out. What's going to happen? But God will always work His purposes in every situation. That's the joy of the Lord. The Lord is working everything out according to His plan. Amen. The reason the walls were built in 52 days, in spite of all that adversity, was because it was God's plan for those walls to be built. Amen. And Jeremiah, Nehemiah, I don't keep saying Jeremiah, uh, Nehemiah was along for the ride. One of my favorite verses is what the Lord Jesus assures us of in John 5, 17. He says, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. He said, Well, that might encourage me too if I only knew what hitherto means. I get it. So I looked it up. Jesus says, My Father, present tense, is working hitherto to this present moment, and I work. So hitherto means to this present moment. Right up to now, my father works and Jesus says, I am working right along with him. Amen. We've got better than an army working his plan out for us. We've got Jehovah God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. My father works to this very present moment and I work. And that was Nehemiah's testimony. And we look at this whole time from the time that Israel was allowed to go back and rebuild the temple, which was 538 B.C., to the completion of the walls, which was 444 B.C. That's less than 100 years. And I want you just to do a quick historical survey and see all that God was working in that period of time for a people that some of them were still in captivity in Babylon and Persia, and just a small remnant were back in Jerusalem. But even in both locations, if you were, if you belonged to God, God was working. So let's just take a quick survey here. King Cyrus decrees the Jews released in 538 B.C. Do you know why he did that? Because God told Jeremiah that it was going to happen in the 70 year period. So Israel was invaded in 605 B.C. and they were allowed to go back in 538 B.C. It was prophesied before it even happened. Let's look over in Jeremiah 29 11. To your right. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. Wait. Ten. Ten. Thank you. For thus saith the Lord that after, after how long? Seventy. Seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to what? Return. Turn to this place. The argument against despair over future uncertainties, the Lord is working everything out according to His plan. So, this new king, from a new kingdom, 
no longer Babylon, the Medo-Persian king, King Cyrus, decrees the Jews' release, just the way Jeremiah said it would happen. Then we have the rebuilding of the temple. It begins in 536. And in that same amount of time, when the temple was being built in Jerusalem, Daniel was still back in Babylon. And in that same year, God delivered him in the lion's den. You see how God works? He's not limited to geography. He's not a respecter of persons. He was working in the Jews in Israel powerfully and miraculously, and he was working with Daniel back in the Babylonian Persian region. A little later than that, Esther becomes queen in 479 in Persia. And it's a good thing because a guy by the name of Haman wanted to annihilate the Jews. And Esther, a Jew, being promoted to queen, was able to stop that from happening through Mordecai and to thwart Haman's evil desire of anti-Semitism. We read about that in Esther chapter 3 and verse 6. Let's go back there real quickly. Right after Nehemiah is Esther. Look what Haman's plan was. Verse 6. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai, the Jews. Wherefore Haman sought to do what? Destroy, Destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Hasarurus, even the people of Mordecai. That's the Jewish name of the king who would be known also as Xerxes. That's his Jewish name there that we see. So that is happening all within this time. And because Haman's plan to annihilate the Jews was not allowed to happen by God working out his purposes, that allowed Nehemiah to be able to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. If this hadn't have happened, this would have never happened. He thought he was going to make this happen for sure. And yet God showed that he's always working according to his purposes. From top to end, the bookshelf of God's power working his purposes. The bookshelf from top to finish, it was all God. And that's why Nehemiah talked the way he did. And that's why Nehemiah said in verse number 16, or why it says in Nehemiah 16, uh, 6, 6, 16, excuse me. When all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their eyes, for they perceived that this work was done of our God. That's your God. The joy of the Lord is your strength. What is my joy in the Lord? My joy in the Lord is God is for me. When I sin, there's nothing He wants more than to restore me and forgive me. God is for me. The joy of the Lord is, is that God is with me in all my difficulties. He's there. What is the joy of the Lord concerning the uncertainty of the future? That God has proven over and over again just in this little Swap of history less than a hundred years that God is always working everything out according to His purpose. Amen. Getting back to the book of Esther because Purim's coming up, March, sundown, March 16th. So you need to go to the Jewish deli and get yourself some hamantaschen and celebrate. But this book of Esther is so remarkable. Let me read you a little commentary. Without ever mentioning God directly, the book of Esther underscores the providence of God. God's promise to give the Jews an eternal ruler remained in place even in the face of threatened annihilation. Esther shows us that many Jews remained faithful to their God even in exile. That's a lesson for us, people. 
They kept their identity as God's people through the synagogues that developed as the centers of, Jew of the Jewish community wherever Jews settled. The synagogues would later play a significant role as the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire. That all started in this time of difficulty. For these served as natural starting places for the deliverance of the gospel in towns visited by the apostles. So concerning the uncertainty of the future, you know what grandma is always asking after she watches the Channel 5 news. Grandma always asks, my word, what is this world coming to? We know exactly what this world is coming to. Turn to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. We started off the message by asking the question, why do I need to go to church? Well, Buster, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's why you need to go to church. And we end with the question, what is this world coming to? Here it is. Revelation 11, 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. What is this world coming to? Very simply, it's coming to the kingdoms of this world, becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. That's the eternal weather report. He shall reign. That's the weather in eternity. He shall reign forever and ever. Wow. So the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? And let's never forget that. Let's use this place of protection for us because... As Dan Bigelow will tell you, there's a good chance that things are going to get worse before they get better. And I spent a lot of time yesterday dealing with people and their problems. I mean, hours yesterday. And it's frightening how much the devil is trying to work against us. He's trying to wear out the saints. We understand that. And we are in danger of falling into despair, being swallowed in despair. We have to remember these things. If God fulfills a protective purpose as we experience the joy of the Lord. Let's stand. We're going to teach you a new song that kind of goes along with all this.